Thanks, Son. I'm um, sorry I haven't been here these last um, yesterday and this morning. I had an offer that I could not refuse to go traveling with the uh, Leisure and Culture Committee of the municipality, who's also my board. So um, I've not been here, which means that I haven't heard the discussions you've had, and I might just uh, have gotten it wrong and be repeating everything. Uh, I'll start where some of you have heard me start before with quoting artist Fred Wilson's statement that for more than a century, museums have waited for the public, the people, to change to fit the museum better, but that it, might, it may now be time for the museums to change to fit the public better. And what I've been looking for in audience research um, is methods or new knowledge that would support such a change in perspective in and for museums. As public service uh, institutions, museums do attempt to direct our resources towards what we think society needs, what people need, what stakeholders need from the museum. But how projective are these interpretations? How projective from what we ourselves like and want and need, and from what we think they want and need and like, or what we think they ought to need and want and like? Good audience research for me is a way of ensuring that the voices of the outside world are heard in the museum. It's a tool for making the blind spots of our personal and professional perspective um, perception and practices visible and making us reflect and confront the things that we tend to take for granted. The national surveys measure the degree of satisfaction with the sector, with each individual museum and its public activities at a particular moment in time. They give little knowledge about why people choose to not visit museums and they do not really explain the different qualities perceived by audiences and the different levels of visitation therefore museums have. At best, the surveys provide us with tools to gauge the composition of audiences and patterns of visitation and to trace over time whether co the, these compositions can be changed by changing practices. In the national trends of the Danish surveys, what's been most important to me is that museums massively favor people with higher education. 27% of museum visits are made up of people with a long, the long academic higher education who make up only 6% of the population. 59% of the visits to museums are made by people in the two highest educational brackets who compose only 21% of the population. Only 15% of visits are made by people with vocational training who make up 33% of the population. I interpret this as an active act of exclusion on the part of museums of large segments of the populations since it is so systematic. If there were no pattern in who non-users of museums are, I might feel differently that using museums is or not using museums is a personal choice like many others, like wearing red or liking oatmeal. But the educational pattern is so clear, so dominant, that for me it transcends the personal. And I know, I know that there's a class bias hidden somewhere in there, which is not explicit and which the National Survey does not talk about. The survey reports that only 4% of non-users state that the museum offers are directed towards other kinds of people. But half the non-users say that they're not interested. This means that non-users seem to have internalized non-use as a lack in themselves, a lack of interest in themselves on their own part, not as a lack of relevant or interesting offers on the part of the museum. They voice no criticism or disappointed expectations that the museum should come up with something that might actually interest them since they are actually paying for the show. This educational pattern of exclusion is, of course, consistent with the way in which knowledge, previous knowledge, learning and learning styles are central parameters of motivation and satisfaction in the survey. What are the parameters of feeling at home, feeling at ease, identification, feeling part of the institution are missing by the survey as core dimensions. 
So I'm interested who and what is not addressed or what is not included in the national surveys. My interests tend to be on the people who choose to stay away from museums or from my current museum anyway, and the point made by Marilyn Hood in staying away, why people choose to not visit museums, that non-use of museums is an active choice anchored in the specific relationship between the museum form and the values, interests, and needs of the individual. Turning now to the figures for the Museum of Copenhagen, I have to confess to a major cook-up in my organization, which means that we have no survey results for 2012, so I'll be speaking from the results of 2011 only. But there's one very short and basic answer to who uses the museum, which is valid for both 11 and 12, which is too bloody few and too many of the same kind. And the most important points for me that come out from the survey, I'm not, I'm not going through all of them, but these are the ones that I find most important. Audiences are actually looking for and responsive to special exhibitions. They are less pleased in the Museum of Copenhagen than they are in general. They are younger than the average, which is great because that's something we worked hard to achieve. They are local, they are more local than the average, which is absolutely not how it ought to be, given that we are the Capitals Museum. They are quick to be out of there quicker than normal, which is not surprising given the small scale of the place. They are even higher educated, which is not at all what we wanted or worked for. They are even more frequent museum users, not what we were aiming for either. And these patterns are even more intense in these directions when we look at the foreign visitors. Over the four or five last years, the Museum of Copenhagen has had an increase in audiences from 32 to 56,000 in the museum building, which is a huge increase if you look at it in terms of percentages. And we have had an unheard of million people who've used the Copenhagen Museum wall. And still I ask, Yes, this is a story of success, and it's also a story of failure, and I'll return to that later. By channeling resources into the exhibition outreach areas and working very strategically with these resources, we transform the galleries from static chronological displays to a series of thematic temporary exhibitions changing on a rolling schedule. We deal with historic subjects through a lens of contemporary issues, and with contemporary issues that are of importance to the city of Copenhagen and the municipality, such as migration, sustainability, etc. We use differentiated languages of form to suit different thematic content and different target groups. We're taking the museum to the street in many different shapes and forms and meeting people where they live and work and walk about. We do outreach into traditionally under-prioritized under areas um, we invite uh, the personal, emotional, subjective interpretations and the sense of unity or totality in people's lives. And these strategies have obviously, as I say, had a very positive impact on our audience uh, figures. The Museum of Copenhagen is not a collection of masterpieces or extremely rare objects or objects that live by their imminent aesthetic value. Our collections live only through their embedded narratives the stories they, or we as a museum, bring out, or the stories we bring to the collections. As many other city museums, the museum has been focused on the bourgeois founding fathers of the city, and we have huge voids in our collections where the everyday life of the residents of the city should be, and where private life, personal life, emotional life, women's and children's lives should have been. As we explore these voids and silent areas, we become increasingly aware that an active collecting process is really an active process of relationship building and of building trust within our communities. We also become aware that this requires stretching our own qualifications uh, and activities, the, the activities to build and to nurture these relationships. The Becoming a Copenhagen Research and Exhibition is a, one of our more successful positionings on the current social and political arena as an institution that deals with current issues on a background of solid historic documentation. 
Internally in the museum, it highlighted the ability of existing collections to be actualized and reinterpreted. In terms of new collecting, however, the museum did not or did not yet have the credentials or reputation out there as an institution that people would entrust with their personal, precious, painful objects of migration or transition. So we return again and again to expanding our participatory working methods as strategies of community building. We've carried out a number of longer term outreach projects in this context with young people in specific neighborhoods, creating documentation and exhibitions in the museum or in the neighborhood itself. We've supplemented the formal archeological work we do with a community dig and with frequent uh, pop-up talks at the sites. Aided by different kinds of audience research, we try to examine our practices critically and become more precise in our choice of media for a given theme and a given target audience. Is, for instance, the current theme of rock and roll in the 1950s proving to be a nostalgia that, as an exhibition, appeals mainly to older generations, while as active events, as the Dan Contest here, it is interesting for a specific segment of young people. The current archaeological exhibition, The Past Beneath Our Feet, is quite exemplary in its use of multiple voices and in bringing together traditional museum expertise with other contemporary voices of subjective or professional expertise. But this whole lovely idea, is this whole lovely idea drowned out or negated by the dominant concern with protecting the objects from light and by an exhibition project that demanded a full reuse and recycling of existing cases in the exhibition design. The plurality of voices is hardly the first thing one thinks about when one sees this uniformity or homogeneity of design. Are there ways in which we unwittingly contradict and defeat our own best intentions? The people who participate, for instance, in our pram walks, do not necessarily want to visit the museum and its exhibition. Even the most eager and avid contributors with images and dialogue to the wall may not want to go to the physical museum. Should we do more to bring them to the physical museum? And would the museum be convincing for them if we drag them there? And these themes that I'm bringing up here are themes that are showing up in some of the more qualitative audience research that we do, which is not the same as the national surveys, but these are themes that we're picking up from other types of research. Our most recent experiment is taking the participatory working methods to one of our most traditional uh, collections, a series of objects left after philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. On the one hand, we examined the continued relevance of the philosophical constructs 200 years after, and on the other hand, we test how a traditional museum collection can be revitalized by bringing it into play in a current um, and lived experience. For this project, um, Objects of Love, Works of Love is the title, we are collecting contemporary objects of love, of friendship, motherhood, falling in love, broken relationships. We have uh, developed a new digital handheld registration system which involves donors of objects behind the scenes and allows them to actually do the registration and documentation themselves. The exhibition will thus continue to grow after opening and hopefully by and by begin to spill over the edges of this minimalist design and mirror much more the complexities and messiness of love in the 21st century somewhat better. But, you know, even if, and we don't know yet, but even if this new collecting process turns out to work as an empowering strategy, it might strengthen rather than the reduce the problematic educational bias that we already have in the composition of the museum audiences. So the next project is less cerebrally defined. We're starting a project that I have lost it after for a long time, urban gardening as both an exhibition project and as a real garden development project, working with the most sensuous and tangible of languages and working with artists, gardeners, with children, children and young people with special needs. We thus adjust and readjust and continue to do so in our planning and programming. So, so far so good. But in some ways I feel that these relative successes 
only lay bare the colossal, colossal and absolute underutilization of the institution as a city museum that's supposed to serve a conurbation of more than a million and a half people. How can we deal with the fact that most Copenhageners and most Danes feel that the museum is irrelevant to their lives? Can the museum, through dialogue, absorb and address needs in society and thereby increase its use value, increase its contributions to society, and, its writ and enrich its communities? What would the museum be like? What would it be if it were, to a much larger extent, to be created from the needs of the surrounding world? Do we know, do we know what's really on the minds of Copenhageners in their everyday lives? Where are Copenhageners concerned with and open towards the global world? Is the past interesting? How is identity tied in with the history of the city? Or is urban identity in the 21st century much more grounded in the choices of the present time in our strategies for the future? What are the expectations of the museum as both expert institution and platform for the voices of the residents? What are the needs for continuous change and renewal in the museum? How far can a museum integrate across sectoral boundaries? Carol Scott has pointed out that the studies of the societal value of museums often appear when the societal economy is under pressure. And museums in this situation often resort to a quite defensive instrumentalization of the use value in terms of, for instance, increased tourism and increased economic turnover. In the Danish context, I think this use value is often defined or instrumentalized in the more tangible and physical aspects as archaeology, cultural environment, planning and protection. In some of the roundtable dialogue that I'm beginning to do also as a total open-ended audience research, I've heard voices that fully appreciate research and excavations, for instance. They also appreciate the need to store objects for, f for further future research also. However, what I as a museum person consider the absolute protagonist the museum as such, a defined building containing objects brought into an interpretive and aesthetic context with each other and an educational exchange with the public, that concept seemed a much vaguer concept with very little power. Internationally, some qualitative research has developed concepts and typologies for the more intangible experiential qualities tied to the objects and works of art as historic evidence or as aesthetic presentation, and spanning values from the historic, the social, the symbolic, and the spiritual. So concluding, what I want to explore is what is not already there, to explore what a museum for the future of Copenhagen might be or could be. I know from experience from starting a new museum that museums can connect, or starting two new museums actually, that museums can connect to needs that people are hardly aware of having, to the notion or concept of a museum institution which is like none other existing. Can we short circuit the distance and separation, the alienation and estrangement between people's needs and the museum as institution? Can we do research as a springboard or a catalyst to the visions of alternative museum forms? Those were my final questions.